Welcome to Hot Topics from Mayo Clinic Laboratories. My name is Dr. Andrew McKeown. Today I'm going to do a presentation on updates to antibody testing in the neuromonology laboratory and a few comments about antibody test utilization. I'm one of the directors of the neuromonology laboratory and I also work as a neurologist in the Department of Neurology at Mayo Clinic. Here are some disclosures regarding uh, patents for various autoantibodies that we've discovered at Mayo Clinic, some of which are implemented in our test profiling already and some of which are to come at a later date. An overview of today's talk is a review of neurological phenotype-based evaluations and why over time we have determined that this is a better approach than a more scattergun approach to autoantibody testing that is currently available through the perineoplastic evaluation to review some of the coming changes to these test profiles and to review from a clinical practice perspective, when is it appropriate to order serum? When is it appropriate to order CSF? And when is it appropriate to order both? So by way of background, autoantibody testing for autoimmune neurological diseases, such as encephalopathies, movement disorders, and myelopathies has become increasingly complex over time. That is because of the number of autoantibodies that have been discovered that are biomarkers for these diseases. The complexity has also been added to by the varying disease specificity. So for some phenotypes, there are particular autoantibodies that are important. For other phenotypes, it's different antibodies again, and there is some overlap of autoantibody specificity between different phenotypes. The specimens used is also important. So for some evaluations, a serum suffices for testing. For others, CSF might be the main thing to, to test for, but serum is generally appropriate in those situations also. Then the assay types vary. So not all antibodies that are reported are the same in terms of their clinical utility. Growing test volumes is also an issue. And so over time, we've had to try to streamline our processes in order to bring about the best care possible in terms of turnaround and in terms of the test utilization. And then also the process of verification of autoantibodies over time has changed. And so there is much stricter guidelines now for what kinds of autoantibodies can be offered for clinical use. And then also maintenance of quality within the laboratory. So all of these factors have made testing more complex, uh, but also clinical care more complex. So broadly speaking, we're still dealing with two main groups of antibodies. These are all potential biomarkers of disease, but some of these are disease effectors, such as NMDA receptor autoantibodies that can have effects on the receptors themselves, downregulating these, but others are simply just biomarkers of disease, likely reflecting a T-cell mediated process. So an example of a T-cell effector related antibody would be PCA1 or anti-O. But over time, the number of antibodies in each of these groups has increased. Taking the last group first, these neuronal nuclear or cytoplasmic antibody biomarkers that aren't pathogenic, but reflective of a perineoplastic T-cell mediated process, as you can see, this has increased over time. So people in medical school would have learned about Hugh, Re, and Yo. But look at just the extent of autoantibodies that are now available in the space. Most of these have perineoplastic significance. I've highlighted some of the uh, some of the exceptions in that in that regard, such as GAD65 antibody and adapter protein 3B2. And then there are also some circumstances where patients are more immunotherapy responsive. So in general, we don't think of these disorders as being particularly immunotherapy responsive, but GFAP, IgG antibody is an exception in that regard. Overall, these disorders have a worse neurological prognosis compared to the plasma membrane directed antibodies that I've listed here. In contrast to the last group, the perineoplastic significance varies, and I've highlighted the ones in green that have a stronger cancer association, such as for NMDA receptor antibody and ovarian teratoma, AMPA receptor and GABA-B receptor antibodies, and then also to antibodies generally associated with Hodgkin lymphoma. 
For, for a lot of these other antibodies that I've indicated here, there's a low predictive value for cancer overall. Often the cancer types can be diverse. And in fact, in the literature, sometimes there's controversy as to whether there is actual perineoplastic significance at all. But again, you can see between the two lists that the profile of antibodies has uh, generally increased over time. Some of these have quite distinct neurological associations, such as NMDA receptor encephalitis. And this will contrast with some of the multifocal uh, type perineoplastic associated antibodies that we saw on the previous slide. So overall, because of this complexity, we think at this stage that it is not prudent to include these all in one evaluation, but more so to base it on the neurological phenotype that the patient presents with. So as you can see, say for movement disorders, the number of autoantibodies here has uh, quite dramatically increased over time as to what is, what is relevant. So most of these are in clinical service already, and, but some of them are to come yet. For example, if we took PCA1 antibody, this is largely associated with ataxia. But something like amphiphysin antibody could be associated with ataxia or stiff person syndrome or a myelopathy or neuropathy. So amphiphysin antibody could end up in multiple different evaluations. It could either be pertinent to myelopathy or to movement disorders uh, or to peripheral neuropathy. The neurological phenotype specific evaluations are made up from the autoantibodies that are demonstrated to you and some others that I didn't include here, but um, really these are based around what is the phenotype of the patient that's presenting in front of us? What autoantibodies would be pertinent in this circumstance? And this could be quite a restricted number of antibodies, say for retinopathy or for uh, CNS demyelinating disease. We're just talking about a couple of biomarkers in um, serum. So for retinopathy, this uh, could be recovering antibody and CRIM5 antibody. For CNS demyelinating disease, this will be acroporin 4 and MOG antibody, just in serum only. In contrast for in autoimmune encephalopathy, both serum and CSF testing will be recommended and there will be a vast array of analytes or antibodies that will be a appropriate to test for in, in that circumstance. For example, LGI-1 antibody will be readily detected in serum and also very specifically detected in serum. In contrast, NMDA receptor antibody and GFAP antibodies will be more sensitively and specifically detected in spinal fluid. So in order to be comprehensive in that situation, we recommend testing both serum and spinal fluid. People often ask us, when should we be considering these? Am I at risk for missing these diagnoses? And our response to that is to really think about the clinical history, how the patient is presenting, what's on the neurological exam. In almost all circumstances, these disorders develop subacutely, so over days to weeks. So these aren't hyperacute disorders like stroke. These aren't chronic progressive disorders like dementia. There's a rapid progression in these symptoms over time. There sometimes can be a fluctuating course, but people have significant loss of functionality over a course of weeks. Sometimes, but not always, there can be an autoimmune history in the background. So a person might have thyroid disease as a clue. Sometimes, but not always, there could be a cancer history pre-existing in the patient as well, or there could be strong family histories of these disorders. And then the differential diagnosis should be considered as well. So for patients presenting with these subacute onset neurological problems, we need to think about all of these other things as well a rapidly progressive degenerative disorder like CJD, primary neurological cancer, the effects of medications or toxins, potentially infection, vitamin deficiencies, other inflammatory disorders for which there are no antibody biomarkers such as multiple sclerosis, sarcoidosis, or this rare Clippers disorder where patients get a lot of inflammation in the brainstem and pons in particular. Then systemic autoimmune diseases, metabolic disorders, endocrinopathy, such as hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, psychiatric disorders. And then there are other tests that should be considered in these situations as well of subacute onset disorders. So cerebrospinal fluid testing is also very important in general 
uh, for these disorders that I've just mentioned, but also for autoimmune neurological disease. Up to 50% of patients with autoimmune encephalitis are antibody negative. And thus testing for the CSF or looking on MRI for clues of autoimmunity are important in those patients as well. So as well as sending autoantibody testing or uh, testing for infection, one should think about testing IgG index synthesis rate in oligoclonal bands, and also kappa-free light chains can be a surrogate for oligoclonal band testing. What about the paraneoplastic evaluation? Well, this was an early workhorse diagnostic test for paraneoplastic disorders when there were limited numbers of antibodies available. These patients generally had diverse phenotypes and the antibodies therein were very classical paraneoplastic antibodies. But over time, there have been more biomarkers made available, some of which have been added to the paraneoplastic evaluation, which have more limited cancer associations, have a lower specificity for a neurological phenotype. And in reality, over time, in terms of how the science has proceeded and how tests have been developed, there are many, many more biomarkers available. Many have neurological phenotype specificity. Many of these have limited or no cancer association. So as a result, we've spent a number of years now building out neurological phenotype specific evaluations and has now gotten to the point where we have the whole neuroaxis covered. And so the paraneoplastic evaluation really has become redundant. At this stage, we recommend not to order this evaluation. Instead, we recommend to order a neurological phenotype specific evaluation. And so whether that's retinopathy, uh, demyelinating disease presentation, encephalopathy, epilepsy or dementia, myelopathy, neuropathy or a movement disorder, we have it covered. So what will I get with these neurological phenotype specific evaluations? Well, all the clinically validated IgG biomarker antibodies for that phenotype, that will include paraneoplastic and other autoimmune biomarkers. So it covers patients with multifocal neurological phenotypes. So for example, if you have a patient who presents with an encephalomyelopathy and you're wondering, uh, could this patient have and a one antibody, uh, which has been associated with that crossover phenotype, that antibody will be found in both evaluations. So in no circumstance is it really appropriate to order two evaluations in the same specimen type. What we do recommend is that people would order both specimen types where appropriate, such as for encephalopathy, and we only make one specimen type available where appropriate for some disorders, such as the CNS demyelinating evaluation. Also, we should point out that these evaluations will then be updated over time as new biomarkers become available, such as the KELCH11 antibody in seminoma in patients with brainstem encephalitis and limbic encephalitis. So that antibody will be incorporated over time into our encephalopathy and movement evaluations. But the paraneoplastic evaluation is not being updated with any of these new biomarkers and hasn't been for some time. So this evaluation is now not only uh, non-specific at times, but is also insensitive. What should I order in summary? Order a neurological phenotype specific evaluation, order a maximum of one serum and one CSF. So as mentioned earlier, there are some evaluations that are really only pertinent in serum, and these are listed here. So retinopathy, CNS demyelinating disease, but also some of our longstanding Mycenae Gravis and Lambert-Eaton syndrome tests, peripheral neuropathy, dysautonomia, GI dysmotility, and necrotizing myopathy. There are others where we recommend both serum and CSF to be tested. Encephalopathy, epilepsy, dementia, movement disorders, myelopathy, stiff person spectrum, and then also pediatric CNS disorders. This is in order to make sure that we capture the full range of antibodies in terms of their analytical sensitivity and specificity in the different specimen types. As mentioned earlier, you can have different antibodies that are more readily detected in different specimen types. So for example, NMDA receptor antibody detected more readily in CSF, and then in serum LGI1 more readily detected. 
So what about patients with known cancers? So an example of this would be a patient who is attending an oncologist and has small cell lung cancer and has been treated for small cell lung cancer and then develops a rapidly progressive myelopathy or neuropathy. And the question that arises is, is this due to the treatment for the cancer or could the patient have developed a paraneoplastic neurological disorder? So in order to cater uh, for these patients, while we are eliminating the paraneoplastic evaluation, we are also bringing out smaller cancer-specific evaluations that will contain autoantibodies specific for that cancer type. But this is really only relevant to oncology practice and not to neurological practice. As well as the paraneoplastic evaluation, we also have some changes that we want to make to the phenotype-specific evaluations. And that really pertains to antibodies that are detected by this immunoprecipitation method, BGKC, anti-calcium channel antibody, PQ calcium channel antibody, and the alpha-3 ACHR antibody. While these are very sensitive screening tests for these particular antibodies, they also have low specificity as we have published on each of these different antibodies. In contrast, there are higher specificity tests for some of these antibodies available at this point. We also have the LGI-1 and CASPER-2 antibodies now available that really have made VGKC complex immunoprecipitation assays redundant at this point. There are a number of autoantibodies that are tested for by immunoprecipitation or ELISA that were initially very good in terms of their specificity for particular disease types, but over time either have become redundant, which I'll explain later on and will be obsoleted, or had been put into general use as neurology disease antibodies, but were less specific outside of the initial intended phenotype and have become the subject of controversy. So there are five changes that I've listed on this slide that account for these changes. First of all, the muscle acetylcholine receptor binding antibody. This had become an antibody in general use in our paraneoplastic evaluation and some other evaluations. There is good specificity of this autoantibody for myasthenia gravis only, and so we're retaining that particular antibody for that testing, but not for other phenotypes. The alpha-3 ganglionic acetylcholine receptor autoantibody similarly has very good specificity for patients with confirmed dysautonomia. And so we think that this is a reasonable test to continue to use in our dysautonomia relevant evaluation. So this would be the autoimmune dysautonomia and GI dysmotility evaluations. The PQ type calcium channel antibody has good specificity in Lambert-Eaton syndrome and has moderate specificity among patients with autoimmune ataxia. Although this is detected by immunoprecipitation assay and can have some specificity issues in ataxia, this is really still the best test available for this particular PQ Ticalcid channel antibody. As a result, we are continuing to offer this antibody in the Lambert-Eaton or myasthenic related evaluations and we will continue to offer this in the movement disorder evaluation. Overall, anti-calcium channel antibody has been found over time not to be additive in terms of specificity for cancer or for neurological phenotype. Similarly with striational antibody, and both of these are being eliminated from our evaluations altogether. And so these tests will be considered obsolete. So in summary, we recommend neurological phenotype-based testing. We recommend testing one serum in spinal fluid. The paraneoplastic evaluation will thus be obsolete as this is not neurological phenotype specific. Antibodies with limited specificity beyond their original use, such as the PQ calcium channel antibody and alpha-3 ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibody are being eliminated from certain evaluations, but are being maintained in the phenotype relevant evaluations. Antibodies with limited specificity, N-type calcium channel antibody and striational are being obsoleted altogether. 
for some of ev- phenotype evaluation, serum will continue to suffice, such as the CNS demyelinating evaluation, acoporin 4 and MOG antibody. But for others, serum and CSF will be needed, such as autoimmune encephalopathy evaluation. Thank you very much for your attention.